If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them along the way in the questions box within the GoToWebinar panel. We'll do a complete Q&A at the end. Um, and as we go, if some, some of the questions do come up that are kind of relevant and need to be answered right away, I don't mind doing that. And as I mentioned, today's webinar will be recorded. You'll receive a link sometime after the webinar, uh, either tomorrow or sometime early next week. We will be providing that for you as well. So who are we? Who is Symparis? Well, we are an enterprise identity protection company. We specialize in uh, preventing uh, cyber data, data breaches. We prevent uh, directory services failures. And we're gonna show you some of how we do that today. I'll be covering some information about uh, more along the lines of what we do. And Darren will be covering a lot of sort of hands-on uh, what it all looks like and how it's actually done. Some of the things that we like to do or, or can do here is automate Active Directory forest recoveries, which is an important part of any real security uh, play at a company as well. Uh, track changes within your directory services, and of course, roll those changes back if they weren't supposed to happen, whether they be accidental or malicious. So like I mentioned, my name is Jason Silva. Um, I can help you along with uh, some of the questions you might have along the way, either today or another day. And uh, Darren Malelli, a 14-time Microsoft MVP in-group policy, and as I mentioned, founder of GPOGuy.com and SDM Software. I guess right. I should put former MVP since they, <laughs> they completely nuked all of the group policy MVPs. <laughs> you know, as, as I was saying it down, I'm like, he's going to jump in right now. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the guy that says that. Uh, it's all good. It was fun while it lasted. <laughs> yeah. I think you got a free pen. Yeah. Um, I got a free pen. <laughs> All right. So Active Directory, it, it just works, right? Well, usually Active Directory has always been real solid. So we haven't had to put much thought into what's going to happen if it all goes down or what's going to happen along the way. What are the day-to-day -day operations that need to be tracked from an operations point of view and from a security point of view? A lot of the things that we see in the news and along these breaches could have been detected along the way. What, if we, what happens with administrative errors? Somebody deletes an OU with 10,000, 1,000, even 100 people, right? It doesn't matter what that number is. 10,000 uh, you know, child objects being removed from a larger company is no different than 100 child objects being removed from a mom and pop shop. We get it. We understand that. Yep, I think when, uh, when, when, micro sorry, when Microsoft added that protect against accidental deletion flag in uh, 80 users and computers, um, which is essentially just putting a deny delete on the objects in question. It probably saved like at least a thousand jobs and at least a uh, hundred thousand <laughs> hours of grief for uh, shops around the world. It was just that simple kind of, you know, preventing the sort of accidental, oops, I clicked the wrong button thing. It makes a big difference. Yeah, I would agree with that. At the same time, on the other side of it, I know I've been in places where I'm like, I got to go shut this thing off. And now it's up to me as a human to go turn it back on when I'm yep. done with what I wanted to do. Exactly. Um, so things things do happen, you know, best laid plans. I think convenience is the um, sort of the villain to all security, right? We all we all want it to work, we want it to work well. So sometimes security uh, goes, a, goes awry on that case. Um, the script's gone bad, right? I mean, we've done it, I've done it. Uh, I don't want to admit it to Darren there, but I've done it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have I've seen. done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I think I've had a few of that. Actually, um, uh, you know, I had a one one interesting anecdote was, um, you know, I knew somebody that was writing a script to basically go out and change some attributes in AD based on group membership. And they were testing the script and they had commented out the group membership test as part of the script test because they were in a test environment and they, they would just wanted to run it against the objects in question and uh, forgot to put the group test back in. And it ended up that uh, all of the objects within the scope of the script got modified, which was uh, a painful process to have to undo it. You know, it's, it's really not a, you know, at that point you, you know, without any other solutions in place, you don't know what the state of those attributes were before you ran the script. So you're kind of at a loss to know how you know what to get back to and that's that's the most painful part about that 
Yeah, I, that's a, that's actually it's funny and it's sad at the same time. But maybe a bit of an omen for what Darren, Darren just said. We'll, we'll show you what would have happened today if that was to happen again. We can see the, the previous state and we can just do a rollback of all those changes in one right. click. Right. Um, external influences as well. There are DNS, DNS issues that come up. I know, especially with, uh, with my lab environment, if something is going wrong, one of the first places I look now is with DNS and then applications behaving badly. And we had, uh, we had a customer that actually deleted an entire DNS zone for a country and uh, essentially all of those users were out of the water until they were able to recover that zone. So DNS can, uh, obviously AD lives and dies by DNS. And if you're using AD integrated DNS, well, you know, that's great, it's there, but sometimes you're not. If you're using external DNS, you might even not have, you know, the team that manages DNS may not even be the team that's running AD. And that's when it can get really scary and tricky because AD obviously, you know, if, if DNS is not healthy or you're know, registering the records that need to be registered, uh, AD is not happy. No, no, it is not. And actually it's a couple of months ago now, but um, at, at Ignite, I've had these conversations. This happens, it's not uncommon that people no. delete a zone. Um, no. So, and, it, and it's, it's terrible. I know some of the folks I talked to, it was years ago that it had happened and they're still sort of dealing with that. Yeah. Um, in this case, well, here again, we could detect and and revert that deal and delete a DNS zone uh, with the click as well. And that's what that's the kind of stuff you'll see. Um, lately, malicious activity. So I know it's a bit ad nauseum to talk about all the things that have happened, but we're talking about it so much because there's still not a good way to prevent these activities from happening, They're not petties of the world or things that would come in and actually corrupt or outright take down Active Directory. Um, so these are things that we need to start planning for. And, and that's the kind of thing we'll talk about today as well. And, and Dan, if you, have a, if you have anything on that before I switch over? No, I just think that it, it, you know, it has changed the landscape in terms of what we have to worry about with respect to AD. Um, yeah. And the, the point of this slide is really that you know, here to for the 18 plus years that AD has been around, um, really most have been around kind of operational challenges. Occasionally you had the rogue employee that would, you know, do something malicious against uh, the company's AD on the way out the door. Uh, but today, um, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the next slide, it's become kind of more of a target for um, bad activity. Yeah. I agree. So, where do we, what are we worrying about? We're worrying about the bad guys, right? The uh, the attackers, right? And I always find it funny that more more so lately, we kept saying the word hackers, hackers, but nowadays hackers are people that are the good guys, and attackers are the ones for the bad reasons. There are lots of new, sophisticated and not so sophisticated attacks targeting AD. Um, some of them do, of course, get more notoriety. Like I mentioned earlier, the not petty is of the world. That that was a very, very destructive, very quick moving, um, you know, malicious code. So we get to see what we can do with, with with that. And these things roughly break into two categories, right? The attacks that are that seek to destroy Active Directory, whether it be ransomware or wiper attacks, they may be trying to uh, encrypt. Uh, Active Directory and hold the company hostage for money for whatever reason it might be, or it might be there just for the sole purpose of taking it down. In either case, we want to have a, uh, what is our plan A? I don't even want to call it a plan B. It's a plan A of recovery. What happens if this all goes wrong? And then, you know, ask yourself, what would happen if, if your AD went down completely? And I mean to dust, you cannot access it. And then, of course, there's attacks that seek to just use AD to compromise credits or move laterally around an, uh, uh, an environment, trying to get um, data, intellectual property, schematics, recipes for Coke, those kind of things. What is it that we're trying to actually um, track down and prevent uh, when we when we see these things? Yeah, for sure. I think um, I mean, I think the latter one is almost harder to deal with. Um, I mean, it. it uh, well, let me qualify that. So, <laughs> if your if your AD is specifically targeted by ransomware or or you know wipers wiperware that just is designed to cause massive destruction, 
well, that's pretty bad. Uh, but but you sort of it's a it's a binary state, right? You're either fine or you're not fine, and you know about it very quickly. And there's as as Jason mentioned, there's been some high profile uh, companies companies like uh, Maersk, the shipping company, and other companies um, across Europe and North America that specifically had their Active Directories, uh, amongst other servers, wiped out and had to recover from those. And and that's that's a pretty you know. I mean, it can take days or weeks without the proper solutions in place to 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 come to grips with that. But the sort of more stealthy, get into the environment, persist for a long while, um, you know, do things slowly, uh, exfiltrate data without you knowing. Those are the ones that are really painful. And I think we just saw an example of that with Starwood Resorts, um, not not yeah. necessarily specifically related to AD, but I think the the current consensus is they were in that environment for four years, exfiltrating all kinds of fun stuff. And, um, and, and that took uh, obviously a, a big toll on that company and almost, almost worse than just having a one and done where your AD is destroyed and okay, I've got to start over. or I have to recover from uh, backups or something like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And that is, that is a big uh, sort of, uh, sort of blight on a company's reputation and brand as well. When those kind of things happened, um, they were already dealing with some other stuff with, uh, with the protests and everything. And now this, and, and oddly enough, oddly enough, Darren, I don't know if you did. I never got an email. I kind of feel left out of the party. I didn't get invited. <laughs> uh, sad, sadly, I did get an email, although it's not clear yet. I think it was a general email to, uh, to, to everyone that was a customer at some point in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I just, I was just amazed at the, at the scope of it. I mean, 500 million, visitors uh, to their hotels. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's, that's not an, I mean, that's a, a substantial portion of the world's population. It just boggles my mind that, that, that could go on for so long without the company knowing what was going on. And, and again, that, you know, that kind of speaks to this idea that, um, you know, if you, if you're not planning for this stuff, I mean, Microsoft has this term they've been using for a few years called assume breach. And the point there is that your posture is, I've been breached already. What do I have to do? And and that's that I think is a good, I mean, albeit cynical way of thinking about things is that you have to assume at any moment that you've been breached and you have a plan in place for being able to detect and respond to that. Yeah, I would I would actually wholeheartedly agree with that. I didn't really go over it, but I spent 13 years of of my life at Beyond Trust, and that's really. What my focus was, was on, you know, endpoint and server, you know, direct security and least privilege. And we always had that sort of attitude. You, you've probably been breached. You know, the average lifespan of vulnerabilities was anywhere from a couple of months to a year before somebody actually detected it. So right. we need to, we need better, we need better tracking, better logging and to see what's actually going on within an environment and, and get it before it becomes a, a newsworthy item. Right. Yeah, completely. So what kind of tools do we have of, well, not us, <laughs> what kind of tools do we attack with that? <laughs> so uh, again, we mentioned it before, WannaCry and NotPetya made the news in a big way. We just kind of covered that with uh, with Maersk, um, high profile wipers and ransomware attacks against large organizations, and it cri crippled them for days. And I know we probably all have at this point, but that uh, that article out of Wired that really dug in um, at the start of it when you know the screen started going black and what did people have to do and what was the consequences and the miles of trucks backing up? Uh, I, I hope they make that one into a movie because that's, I'll, I'll watch that one all day long. Right. Uh, not, not totally. that I'm happy that it happened, but it is a, a good thing. Uh, yeah. to watch. Um, we need to understand what that really meant. And, and, and granted as large as these companies were, we just don't talk about some of the smaller ones, but there was even um, a little borough, a city town, if you would, in Alaska, that had similar types of attacks happened to them. There may have only been 700 servers there, but again, to them, world, and just like with you guys, whatever size your company is, if your AD goes down, that is your whole world right there. And yeah. we can't rely on a power outage uh, in Ghana to, to, uh, to help us, to save us, right? Yeah, no, that's it's a good point. I think you know the the point here is that it is kind of the um, I mean Microsoft refers to it as the control plane. Um, it's really your access into your environment, whether it's applications or resources or data. It, it you know uh, in in a lot of organizations the buck stops at AD. AD's 
helping people. It's authorizing people directly or indirectly, even if you're in uh, Azure AD and Office 365. In a lot of cases, you know, customers are coming back to on-prem AD for the ultimate authentication handshake. So AD is kind of the linchpin for pretty much everything in even smaller organizations, but for sure in larger organizations. Yeah, yeah, great. I won't, I won't need to go through all of these here. And the next two, actually, you can use for good or evil, right? It's like the Jedi <laughs> and the Sith. Yeah. Bloodhound and, uh, and Mimikatz, right? I've seen them used in both, both kinds yeah. of... Yeah. I mean, I think this, you know, Bloodhound is uh, it's one of my favorite tools for, um, for good and for evil, uh, so to speak. Um, it, you know, it was developed by the folks at Spectre Ops. And we actually had two of the authors of Bloodhound speaking at our HIP conference uh, in November in New York and talking about using Bloodhound as a defensive tool. And for those of you that haven't looked at Bloodhound, I highly encourage you to go get it and play with it. Um, essentially what Bloodhound is doing is it's using uh, kind of the weaknesses that have been built into many of our ADs over the last 18 years, You know, poor delegation, uh, really poor management of uh, objects within AD. It's using that information to draw paths to find domain admin uh, access. And, and you'd be amazed at, even in a reasonable sized organization, you run Bloodhound against your AD. And, and again, you're doing this from the perspective of, let's, let's say a, a pen test, um, where you're, 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 you're the friendly that's trying to find out where you have weaknesses. Running AD is kind of a, as far as I'm concerned, it's sort of de rigueur for, for, for most AD shops of any decent size, meaning that you should be doing it as a normal course of finding ways of shutting down those paths um, as a defensive tool. Uh, because if you don't do it, you can be sure that the attacker is probably using it or tools like it to find those paths themselves. So once you get into the environment, Bloodhound lets you see where you can essentially elevate privilege all the way up to domain admin or, or whatever privileged account you might be wor worried about. And and it does that, you know, in concert with tools like Mimikatz. So Mimikatz is really the kind of gold standard for harvesting credentials off of systems. What what Bloodhound is doing is it's finding those systems that have credentials on them that were worth harvesting uh, because they eventually lead to higher levels of privilege. And then Mimikatz is is being used to uh, to basically harvest those credentials and use them in the environment. And and Mimikatz has a lot of knives in its Swiss Army, uh, Swiss Army knife. Um, and a couple of those are DC Sync and DC Shadow, which are kind of opposite sides of the same coin. And I'm going to show DC Shadow in a little bit. Um, it's a it's a newer uh, switch in, in Mimikatz, but it essentially lets you pretend to be a domain controller and inject objects or object changes into AD without them being notified or no noticed on your security logs. So it's super powerful. Yeah, and a little bit scary. Um, yeah, and John the Ripper and, and, and Kerber hosting. I'm not sure if you want to talk about uh, those kind of things. And I apologize for the the slide. The last line there just says, if you if you kind of follow some of the um, some of the blogs that are going around, um, we always kind of saw that the the forest was the boundary, was the security boundary within AD. That's not necessarily true anymore. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think these are all of a piece with you know, getting people, uh, attackers getting more sophisticated about taking advantage of your AD as it's existed probably in the same state for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, um, finally getting sophisticated about uh, understanding how to take advantage of that. And really, it's, it's, it's been an, an accident waiting to happen as far as I'm concerned with respect to AD. Um, a lot of these techniques, uh, like Kerber roasting, is really just looking for uh, you know, service, uh, you know, user accounts, probably service accounts that have uh, Kerberos SPNs associated with them that potentially haven't had their passwords changed in a while. And we all know in our environments that we probably have these scenarios where you've got service accounts that have set to password never expire because it's too painful to have to manage the rotation of those service accounts. And that makes them uh, really kind of open to password cracking. And once you crack the password, you can use their uh, service principal name to essentially grab Kerberos tickets to be able to request services to pretty much anything. And that Kerber, Kerber roasting technique has, 
has come up recently. Uh, the the other one, the the cross forest one, was an was an article that uh, Will Schroeder at uh, SpectreOps basically wrote up recently around a, a known bug that in the spooler service that uh, ha- was used to sort of essentially cross forest boundaries when you had forest trusts in place. So so that was a really interesting one that again is is exploiting you know kind of well known configurations in Active Directory. And and along with you know sort of do- documented vulnerabilities that may or may not have been patched, to to basically um, you know, cross forest trusts with impunity. Yeah, that's impressive. And, and I think one thing I'll say too is you know we talk about Bloodhound and Mimikatz, and we know Mimikatz these days would be very difficult to run on a system because there's a lot of automated sort of protections against it. I think what from what I've learned in, in just with my time in IT. These are just the well-known things, right? Just because something has a defense against Mimikatz directly doesn't mean that someone, you know, is not going to use similar techniques and just call it something else later. Um, so we do need to uh, to be vigilant in, in what we're actually doing here. So what's a girl, a girl, gal, or guy to do? Well, first and foremost, and this one's very important, have a tested backup and recovery plan for the entirety of AD. That includes your petitions, exchange, all the sites everywhere. Um, make sure it works, right? Um, in case of malware, you can't know for sure when a system was compromised, so you have to be prepared. Um, one of the things that is understandably comes up as a question is, well, if just because I have a backup, well, how do I know that the malware is not on that backup? We'll talk a little bit about how we do, and you can't see me, but I'm putting air quotes in the air, how we do. It's a little bit different. I think you'll like it there as well. And then just a quick link when you get these uh, these uh, to yourselves. Uh, that's a quick little uh, video on uh, really same thing we're just saying here. What did, what did it mean for not petty to attack? And what does it mean for us now going forward? Auditing can help, but you got to know what to look for. It's a needle in a haystack or... If you're a Criminal Minds fan, one of Spencer there is like it's a needle in a, in, a, in a pile of needles, right? What is it you're actually looking for to know? What are the indicators of compromise that uh, that we need to be? And Darren talked about this a little bit with DC Sync and DC Shadow, uh, not easily audited, if at all. Uh, so we need a way to quickly identify and revert malicious or accidental changes or the whole thing within AD. And Darren, anything on this slide that you want to uh, sort of cover in? No, I mean, I think this is is really just um, talking about uh, sh- sh- what what you need to be aware of. Um, you, you certainly need uh, a plan for big disasters as well as little disasters, um, and that, that's kind of the theme of this talk. Is you know, there's there's everything from sort of accidental stuff that you have to cope with that you've you know, sort of self imposed wounds to sort of the, the, the worst case scenario, which is external people getting in and compromising your AD. So you sort of have to be prepared at both levels. And at, at, at the high end level, you have to be prepared to be able to recover your Active Directory forest from absolutely nothing. If it's completely burned to the ground because of an attacker, um, again, we, we've seen this. I, I personally know of a company in Europe that had all of their DCs specifically targeted and encrypted. And, and it took them something like two or three weeks to get back. The only thing that saved them was they happened to have an offsite backup of some DCs that allowed them to be able to get back to a, you know, a previous state. It wasn't even a current backup. Um, painful process to have to go from no DCs to recovering one or two DCs per domain from a backup to then having all of your DCs back up and running in the environment. It's just not a pleasant thing to have to deal with. So you sort of have to, you have to have a plan at that level. And then at the kind of operational level, you need to have a plan for how do I detect when maybe the the sort of slow burning changes, you know, somebody's in the environment with a bloodhound type capability, making changes to ACLs or making changes to, uh, you know, objects that you wouldn't normally see. or normally want, how do I track those, as well as how do I track the accidental changes and how do I undo those? So I think that's the point here. Yeah, and I think the other point too, and we kind of said it uh, with with Bloodhound and the Mimikatz, at the time of an attack, it's probably not the time to learn how to use those. So we do highly encourage you to uh, (laughs) to take a peek 
uh, at them yeah. now uh, rather than later, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about what we do. What are the names, right? So we have uh, the Samparis uh, Directory Services or DS Protector. Uh, that's going to be a big focus of today and what Darren's going to kind of go over here in just a, a minute or two. Uh, this is what we use for the real-time tracking, um, searches, auto notifications, rollbacks of changes that uh, weren't supposed to happen, whether they were just a script or they were actually something uh, um, that indicates something uh, something was going on within the environment. And on the other side of the house, we have the Active Directory Forest Recovery. This is the piece that will take a, a backup of AD and allow you to recover the entire AD from absolutely nothing to the same or even alternate hardware. It's agnostic to where we recover to. And that's pretty awesome. All right. Yeah. And that, that last point about the hardware agnosticism um, really is about that scenario we talked about where you you don't necessarily know when malware may have been introduced into your environment. So if you're taking system state backups of your DCs, you can't necessarily rely on those backups not reintroducing the malware back into your servers when you recover to them. So the point we make here with our Active Directory Forest Recovery solution is you take backups of AD. If you need to recover those domain controllers, you bring up a pristine you know, Windows server from ISO. And as long as it's the same version of operating system from as the, as the backup is, essentially plant AD back onto that clean ISO uh, in a way that guarantees that that DC is back up and running without any kind of uh, baggage coming along with it in terms of the malware. So you're essentially, and, and, and oh, by the way, it doesn't necessarily need to be the same hardware configuration. So if you had production AD domain controllers that were on physical boxes and you need to spin up an environment quickly to recover from malware, you're going to probably spin that up on a virtual environment, maybe ESX or Hyper-V. And we don't care that the backups were taken on physical. As long as we have an operating system, a clean OS that we can install to, we'll get those DCs back up and running. Wonderful. All right. It really, it really is magic, as one customer said recently. <laughs> it is magic, yes. <laughs> it's magic. All right. Uh, if you would be so kind, Darren, I believe uh, everyone is pretty excited to see what this stuff actually looks like. Yeah, uh, I think I need to be made presenter. That I can do for you, sir. Thank you, sir. All yours. Thank you. All right. All right. So, uh, let me know if you can see my screen, Jason. I should I see can. Active Directory users and computers up and running. Great. Yep. So, um, so what I'm going to do as kind of an introduction to what we do is I'm going to kind of simulate some of the things that I was talking about. Um, so, so I'm going to start with the accidental one, and and let's take uh, kind of as a uh, as a as an intro to this. Let's take the let's say I've written a script that wants to change the department code on a set of users that are in a particular group. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simulate that by actually selecting a bunch of users that are not necessarily the users I had intended to. I'm gonna choose properties, I'm gonna to go to organization, and I'm gonna enter in a department code, so 105, 1044. Now what I've just done is, um, entered in a department code across a set of users that shouldn't have had that department code entered into them. They, they may have had existing department codes. They may have had other, you know, they may have not had a department code, but the point is I've entered in the wrong department code for a set of users. And maybe it was a different OU I meant to target. And now this, these users that I just selected are now stamped with the wrong department code. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to come into a different OU, and I'm going to delete a few users. Maybe these users were accidentally deleted by the help desk when they were trying to solve a problem. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come in to domain admins and do the unspeakable, which is to add some random user to the domain admins group. So we're going to add Jacob to the domain admins group. 
So these are all things that you might encounter in the normal course of managing AD and just making, you know, making mistakes along the way. So I've just squ switched screens to the DSP or D D DS protector management server. And I'm gonna go ahead and log in. And DSP is our solution for AD object level change tracking, as well as the ability to roll back those changes. So what you see is um, a little dashboard that shows you kind of the changes that have happened, um, tr changes, you know, trends over time. So I can switch the, 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 the scale of this, but I can see, you know, objects that were created, objects that were modified, deleted, et cetera. And if I come into changed items, I can actually go in and see, I call it the ticker tape of changes that are happening within Active Directory. So if I click on this last one here, this most recent one, you'll see there's my adding of Jacob to the domain admins group. So Jacob was added by Darren to the domain admins group. That's you know obviously not something I wanna have in there. And then you can see all of those department users whose department fields were, were set. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna undo Jacob being set to domain admin. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove this and Jacob will be removed from domain admins. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to deal with those department issues. So those department issues, I want to basically make it easy on myself. So I know that the department attribute was modified. And I know that Darren made the, the change. He's the one that ran the script. Not a very careful guy. So I'm going to go ahead and search for just department changes by Darren. And I, I could have entered the time frame in there, but essentially I was able to, you know, put this um, essentially, you know, just scope it to, to the current time frame because it happened fairly recently. And there you see all of the old values for Darren. And, you know, each one is different for the different users. But what I want to do, uh, they're all set to this new value. What I want to do is select all of them and undo them. And keep in mind, this is happening in real time. I'm not having to mount backups that I did yesterday or the day before, look for them at users that, I, that have been modified and select those and then restore those. I'm, I'm, all of this is happening in real time. And, and just to kind of articulate what behind the scenes, we actually have the ability to track changes from two different sources. So when a change happens in the environment, the change is coming in via the replication API that AD uses in domain controllers to talk to each other. So regardless of what happens in the security event log, we will see changes, regardless of whether the, somebody comes in and clears the security event log or uh, stops the agent. When our agent comes up, we will always see the changes because we're using the same mechanism that domain controllers use to talk to each other. So domain controllers, they could be down for uh, you know an hour or two. When they come back up, they're going to say, "Hey, give me the latest changes since the last time I replicated." And that's the same mechanism mechanism we're using to capture these changes and store the state of these objects in 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 DSP. Now, what we also do, and you'll see it down here, is I come in and I have who made the change. Well, that information is not tracked in the replication mechanism, but it is tracked in the security event log. So what I do is I will grab those events out of the security event log and I will correlate them back to change. So I'm getting two sources of data to ensure that this record is actually what happened. And it allows me to have kind of a full tracking of who's doing what within the environment. Now, I also have the ability to notify based on specific changes in the environment. So you'll see here, I have a number of rules that I've created. I have a domain admins rule that says, hey, show me when the membership attribute on domain admins changes. Um, show me when specific users in an OU are locked out. Show me when the admin SD holder object changes. And I'm looking for the basically the ACL on that, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
basically all sorts of changes that I can track based on criteria that you provide. So I talked about those kind of accidental changes. Let's talk about some of the more malicious changes. So we talked about admin SD holder. Everyone probably knows what admin SD holder is. Admin SD holder is this special object. Its ACL is stamped on a set of privileged groups within the environment. So if you're in a group that has an admin count attribute set to one, the admin SD holder will automatically stamp the ACL on that group with whatever is on its ACL. So if I were to come in here and I added a user account that I have called bad guy, maybe this is some information that I got from that from um, Bloodhound that bad guy is a user that I wanna be able to get access to. Or I, if I get access to bad guy, he's gonna be able to get access to other things. And if I have write permissions, if I've got write permissions on the admin SD holder object, I can edit it, change its ACL, and away we go. I wanna know when that happens in DSP and essentially be able to undo it. So what I can do is essentially see those changes as they're happening in the environment. And we'll, give it a, we'll give it some time to percolate in. And there's my admin SD holder change. If I right click on the record and say compare values, you will see there's my bad guy who's been given full control over admin SD holder. There's gonna be a thread that's gonna kick off eventually on the, D, on the PDC emulator that's gonna to try to model the ACLs on all of my administrative groups to match the admin SD holder. I don't want that. I can see who made that change. And again, it was that bad guy, Darren. And I can undo it before the admin SD holder has a chance to trigger it. So I'm gonna say undo. And it's essentially that ACL change on admin SD holder. And the same holds true for other things that you might do. So, you know, let's say Bloodhound has told you that you have this user that you can get access to, you can steal their credentials and they have full control over a particular object. Let's say they have full control over the GP link attributes or the, the domain level attributes and they can change the GP link attribute to put in arbitrary GPOs linked at the domain level or remove arbitrary GPOs. Let's say, you know, I'm just gonna make a change here, just kind of an arbitrary change to say this is uh, an enforced link. So I've just changed GP processing at the domain level. And again, I can go in and let DSP find that change, see that change as it occurs. And we'll let it, we'll let it percolate through there. And once that change makes it into DSP, and there it is, I can see basically difference that I made. Again, I can compare values, see the change, and I can undo the change. And it's as simple as that. So you have a lot of power. And again, I can also notify on certain classes of changes. So I have a lot of power to be able to um, be notified that a change has happened, come to DSP and undo that change before it causes problems. Now, I wanna kind of up the ante a little bit. I talked about Mimi Cats and DC Shadow, and this is a really interesting capability. So let me, let me go into my admin machine. I have Mimi Cats running right now, and I'm gonna, basically show you how you can create a fake domain and push arbitrary changes into Active Directory. Now, DC Shadow is not a trivial capability. You do need to have sufficient rights on Active Directory to be able to write objects to the configuration naming context to register a fake domain controller temporarily, and then essentially be able to push replication notifications to a partner DC. Now, the interesting thing about DC Shadow is under normal circumstances, if I made a change to a user, let's say I put a user in the domain admins group, 
there's going to be a security event log error or uh, uh, event that's registered on the originating DC where that change occurred. So you'll be able to see it. And if, you're, if you have a tool that's relying on security event logs, they would see that and they'd be able to react to that. But DC Shadow, because it's a fake domain controller that's just doing replication, the originating DC in this case is my fake domain controller. There is no security event log for this change. And this is where DSP can actually help uniquely because we're using that replication API. We're not relying strictly on the security event log. So here's what I'm gonna do. So I have this account and this account is called bad guy. And bad guy is just a regular user, domain user, no privileges whatsoever. I'm going to escalate or elevate bad guy to domain admins. Now, again, I need to be have I ha, I need to have already compromised AD to use DC Shadow and Mimi Cats. In other words, I need sufficient privileges, you know, something like domain admin to do this. But the point is, if I've if I've compromised AD, I've gotten domain admin without you knowing about it. You know, maybe I've used uh, Bloodhound to find a path to domain admin for a user account. Then the key for me is to stay in the environment as long as possible so I can exfiltrate data, see what users are doing, crack password hashes, etc. And for me to do that, I need to be able to have multiple avenues to get data. So if I can elevate a user account, another user account to domain admin without you knowing about it because it doesn't trip your event log, your seam, then I've won, right? I've gotten another pathway to finding interesting stuff in your environment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say, I wanna change the primary group, group ID on bad guy to 512. This is essentially granting me admin access. So I'm calling, I'm in Mimi Cats, I'm calling LSA dump DC shadow on the bad guy object, modifying the primary group ID attribute with a value of 512. Right now it's 513. So now I am sitting here, I am essentially running as a fake server, Semperis lab test, Semperis lab dot lab. And it tells me that this is the change that I'm waiting to replicate. If I come into my other window, I'm gonna go ahead and do an L dump, LSA dump DC shadow put send push replication, I, a push replication notification to my partner. Now, I don't necessarily need to do this. I could wait the 15 minutes or whatever the interval is for a replication to happen with my partner. Essentially, what I've done is if I come into ADSI edit, and actually, I think what will happen is once I do this, once I do the push, and we'll see if we can catch it. What I will have seen is, there it is. You'll see it was only there for a second, but I added a, basically a replication partner to sites and services to the, to the topology. And then of course it went away just as quickly as it ran. Nope, I don't wanna delete that. Let me refresh it. You'll see now it's gone, but I did it just long enough to send the object change to the user. So now if I come back into users and computers, click on refresh, and look at that, I'm now in domain admins. Now let's look at the security event log on the DC where that happened. So that was originated on DC three, I think. Let me just double check that. So uh, actually it was DC one that originated the change. So if I come in, let me just change this to DC one, look at the Windows event log, look at the security log. What I'm looking for are 5136 changes to the bad guy account. Now I have 5136 changes, but what you're gonna see is these are not related to the bad guy account. These are related to the DC that I just registered in 80 users and computers, 
or in 80 sites and services. So what you're seeing are, you are seeing evidence of a, a essentially a DC being added, but you don't actually see an event for the bad guy change. So none of these events relate to bad guy getting changed. See, these are just like attributes related to sites and services. So I've essentially done this change without the security event log knowing about it. Now, if I come into DSP and I come into changed items, what are we gonna see? Let's give it a little time. You'll see the service principle changes that are course, whenever, whenever you do a demo, you do a demo, you practice it, you make sure it works as expected, and then, <laughs> and then it doesn't work as expected when you finally come in with it. Uh, I love that. What, what, what I should see here is that you'll see the change to bad guy to get the new attribute. And I'm not sure why I'm not seeing that. So let me make sure I've got my search requests cleared out. And let me do a live search. It's funny. <laughs> I love this. Uh, well, what I saw here, I can show you what I saw yesterday when I did this. Uh, let me do, let me do a search from yesterday. And I will search on object. Actually, let me do a search on primary group ID. Oh, that's curious. Maybe I didn't make that. It's making me a liar. All right, let's do this and let's say search for primary group ID. And there is, there it is. So this is the change that I saw yesterday when I was testing this. And essentially what it was showing me is that even though I didn't have the changed by information, I did have the event itself, I saw that primary group ID was changed from 513 to 512, making this user the domain admin. And if I were to right click and undo it, I could undo that change without any problem. And, and that's what should have shown up. I must have something wrong with my, uh, if my test infrastructure since yesterday, but that's what should have shown up today when I was, when I was looking at changes, I would see the change to that user account because we're getting the change via the replication API, we don't rely on the security event log. We basically um, see that change as it happens and give you the ability to undo that change. So even with tools like DC Shadow, which essentially basically try to get by undetected because of the way we're tracking changes, we have the ability to sort of see those changes even though they haven't shown up in the security event log. So just to kind of kind of put a bow on it and, and we'll leave some time for questions. DSP is really around tracking changes and giving the ability to undo those changes. We're getting the data from multiple sources. And as you can see here, we handle deleted objects. We handle changes to the config partition, schema partition, DNS, GPOs, um, any, any kinds of changes that you might have against Active Directory. Uh, you know, the, the DNS one is, is we can handle deleted zones. If you've deleted a zone, that scenario we talked about earlier, zones, any kind of zones that you might have AD integrated, we'll see changes to those and give you the ability to undo those. So, uh, you know, kind of a complete solution for uh, doing change tracking, doing real-time audit notification against your Active Directory environment. And uh, with that, I want to hand it back over to Jason to kind of run with the questions. Thank you, Darren, that was fantastic. Just a few of them. Uh, first one is this run on-prem. Uh, yes, you do own it. 
um, it's not a uh, it's not a SaaS model. So you would install the uh, the management console that you see here within your organization. That's not to say that it can't be a cloud resource that you have actually running as well. Um, anything else on that, Darren? Or if you want to. Nope, nope. That's yeah, uh, spot on. Yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, next one are, is an agent. An agent will need to be installed on all the DCs, right? So. Um, there's two pieces, and this is this is key for what if if it didn't catch it as Darren was going through it. We're tracking information from the API itself, as well as from the the, the event logs. So there is an agent that looks at the API changes. That does not have to go on every DC. We usually ask for you know just a couple of them, so we can track within each domain kind of thing. But you can have multiple domains within a within a larger forest. The other one that looks at specifically that event information, that one would go on each of them because that's the only place that that actually exists. So hopefully that answers the question for you as well. Um, I see you just add another one, Franco. Uh, how much load does it put on the DCs? It's negligible. We, we have no um, indication of, of negative performance at as large as customers as we have. And they, they range in hundreds of thousands of, of users and many, many DCs. So you won't see a performance problem uh, with uh, with the agent as all. Um, and actually, uh, and the other question was, does this track and restore schema changes? It, it will it will track schema changes. And you can see there, there's a, a little on the left yep. hand side there, just above what he has highlighted is a schema partition. So if something changes within there as well, we will see and track those. Um, yep. As far as restoring, uh, Darren, if uh, you want to kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah, so we uh, we don't have any special magic there, you, you would still need to use our forest recovery solution to do a schema rollback. Uh, so, you know, that's unfortunate, uh, but we can't do incremental schema backouts from the, uh, from, from the DSP product. You would need to basically do a forest recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing we didn't really cover uh, with any demo type stuff today, but please, if you want to see what that's all about, uh, please be in touch. Uh, we happy to, happy to hear from you and, and cover that more. I don't see other uh, other questions. So those are those that are actually the ones that, that typically get asked uh, anyway. So I'm glad you uh, you asked those as well. Um, so like I said, you will get a a link to the recording for this today. There'll be some other information about how to uh, how to get in touch with us. Um, actually, let me. Uh, Put this up on the screen as well, and I can take over for a second on the uh, on yeah. the presenter as well. Please, mm -hmm. there we go. Perfect. Make sure I'm showing the right one. Yep. So just a little information of how to get in touch with us. Info at sympowers.com will always work. Give us a call. Go visit our website. See what it is we're all about. Um, again, I want to uh, respect everyone's time. I really appreciate everyone jumping in today. Yeah, um, thank you. Hopefully, uh, we hear from you soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Darren. Thanks, Jason.